What's up, CoderBite? Welcome back to another Data Structures and Algorithms video. I'm Elizabeth, and today we are kicking off a new series. We're going to be talking all about dynamic arrays. Now, I think these are super valuable problems to practice because, number one, I think they're slightly easier than some of the problems we've done so far, such as the ones in the graph series. But I think that they make up the bulk of the interview questions you'll see in the general marketplace while you're searching for a job. I think a lot of graphs problems you may encounter at like one of the FANG companies, right? Facebook, Google, whatever. But these are the these dynamic array problems often are the ones that people use to find out what are your basic foundational skills as a programmer? Show me how it's done. You know what I'm saying? So without further ado, let's jump into this week's problem and hopefully we'll see you in the coming few videos as we talk more about these very dynamic data structures. And now for this week's problem. Given an array R of integers, return an array products such that products at index, excuse me, at I, right, is equal to the product of all of the elements of R except for R at I. Solve without the division operator in with a big O of N, right? Okay, so in case you didn't understand those words, basically we are given an array of integers and we have to return a new array, right, called products. And we want products that at every index I is equal to the product of all of the other numbers except for whatever the number is at that index in the original array, right? So let's look at some examples here. So here are some examples. Here's an array of one, two, three, and four. And first, I want you to see that we are multiplying every other integer except for the one that is at that index, right? So at this index, zero, right? we are multiplying two, three, and four, which is everything but one, right? Then we go to the first index, right? So we wanna multiply everything except for the thing at index one, right? So that is one, three, and four here. One, three, and four, and so on and so forth. And of course, we can actually multiply those out and get integers, and this is what is returned. Here is another example of exactly the same thing. We have, uh, you know, at index zero, we have five. So we multiply eight times seven times 10 as seen here, which is 560, et cetera, et cetera. And even if there is a zero in there, the same rules apply, right? Except we get a lot of zeros, right? Because anytime there's a zero in the mix of numbers, uh, the product becomes zero. Okay, so with our brains, we kind of just walk through some examples, right? So this should give you some sort of hint as to at least a naive appro approach, right? Or a brute force approach, something that you are not going to say is your final answer, but might very well be a good stepping stone into what your final answer will become. So with our brains, what did we do? We went through each index, right, of the array. So let's take this first example. Um, and we basically multiplied all the other in integers unless, right, we almost maintained our pointer, right, a reference to this first index, and then we looped over the rest of the array again, right, kind of like a nested for loop. And we added all of these, you know, the multiplications to each time, right, with each loop of our second for loop, unless the index of the second for loop was the same as the index of the first for loop, right? So that would be our naive approach for this particular algorithm. So again, in this case, we have a nested for loop where we're multiplying the integer at every index by the integer at every nested index, unless the nested index is the same as the original index of the outer for loop. So here's our array, right? So we maintain that hold on that first index, right? This is our outer for loop in orange. And then we loop over the rest of the array unless that second or the second index is the same as the first index, right? So here in yellow, we have two, then three, then four, which becomes two times three times four, which is 24. And then the outer for loop continues, right? We have our first index, we're at uh, number two. And we go around the entire array like so, exactly like we just did, that's 12. 
we continue on our outer for loop, we continue collecting the rest of the integers and so on, we get eight. And then finally at four, we go through the rest of them, one times two times three, and we get six. So that is our naive approach, right? And I think that the very important thing is you at least get that, right? So I think that many people, they discount the naive approach. They push it from their minds. They're very, very anxious about the actual answer. So anxious, in fact, that they completely forget about the naive approach. And I always say, better a naive approach than nothing, right? And also, often, in case you're having a lot of trouble coming to that other solution, it might be because you're skipping a bunch of steps. And often, going through that naive approach, really understanding the naive approach, can help you build the actual foundation of your actual answer that you're going to give. So I always say to people, make sure that you, you know those naive approaches. It's a great tool to use on the way to getting to your actual algorithm. So what are we going to do? How are we going to actually solve this? So let's start to build our actual algorithm, right? Because we just made one, but it's going to be uh, O of n squared time complexity because we have a next for loop right off the bat. So the problem already said that there is definitely a solution with a big O of n. So we can certainly do better than that. So what can we do to start to you know, think about this? First, this is going to be a greedy approach. And what does that mean? If you're not familiar, a greedy algorithm is an algorithm that builds on a solution piece by piece, always choosing the next piece that offers the most obvious and immediate benefit. So we haven't talked about an algorithm yet, but I want you to kind of have this in your head as we look at the numbers and we see what we're doing, that this is going to be a greedy approach. Uh, so we're going to be doing this piece by piece, the next best piece until we get to our answer sort of situation. So let's take an example here. Here we have, you know, an array, one, two, three, four, five. Excellent. We've now done this many times, right? We have all of our numbers that we are multiplying out and we are creating this new array. So here I just wanted to really show um, that, you know, these numbers are corresponding to this index, which has a one at it. These are corresponding to two, which has, excuse me, the first index, which has a two in it, et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay, so let's look at these numbers. What is happening here? So here we're doing two times three times four times five. Here we're doing one times three times four times five. Here we're doing one times two times four times five. Now, if you're like, Elizabeth, quit repeating yourself. You would be correct. That is exactly what I wanted you to notice. In fact, we can see that we are repeating certain, you know, there are certain numbers that we are continuing to use in our computations over and over and over again, right? So like that one is going to be the same one as over here, this one times two. This one times two is the same one times two as this, right? And that one times two times three. And so this one times two times three is the same as the one times two times three in this, this right here, right? Okay, so what can we do with that information? So let's see first, I think I have that all nicely highlighted right in orange. And let's actually see what are those numbers and how do they relate to the array? What, what is the pattern here? Because there's certainly a pattern, right? So I think the thing to notice is, let's see. At two, right, or index one, right, so that's here, what's highlighted is the number before it, right? And then here for three, what's highlighted is the numbers before it. And then for four, what's highlighted here are the numbers before it in the array, et cetera, et cetera. And so let's look, what is the pattern for these white numbers that we haven't talked about yet? Those are not being repeated in you know, this particular sequence, right? So let's look here. So there's nothing here, obviously, because we're starting at five, right? We're at, we're at the end. And here we are, we get five. And then we get five times four. So that five is the same five as this, right? And this same five times four is the one that's in this five times four times three. And then that five times four times three is the same five times four times three that's in here, right? And it is the same exact pattern in reverse, right? 
So at four, we are getting the numbers after it, right? So five is after four. And then at three, we get four and five, which are the numbers after it. And at two, we get the numbers after it, which are three, four, and five, three, four, and five, and so on. So what is our algorithm? So we can kind of see that basically at every index in this subarray, what we're doing is we are tracking all of the numbers, products of all of the numbers before it times all of the products of all of the numbers after it, right? At any given index, all of these numbers are the products of all the numbers that came before it and after it, which is another way of saying exactly what the problem asked for, right? We're taking the products of all of the numbers outside of the one that we're currently sitting on top of, right? And they grow one by one as the for loop continues, right? As we continue to move on with our for loop, each time we iterate, we take the next number. And that's what makes this a greedy algorithm, right? Every single iteration of the problem, we take the previous answer that was the best answer we had, and then we multiply by the next answer, right? The next sub problem, the next one, until we get to the end of the, the array. And then we can do the same thing in reverse, right? So I hope that makes sense. Um, you know, this is one, this is a problem that definitely took me a little bit of time to kind of wrap my head around. But once you see it, it's like, oh yeah, you can just maintain some pointer, right? Some reference to what the product is so far and then continue to multiply by the next one, right? And that's how we can slowly fill out this array. So we're gonna do this in code and hopefully uh, when we do it in code, it will become even more obvious to you how exactly this algorithm is functioning. So let's code out this algorithm. I've gone ahead and filled out some test cases that we'll use after we write our function. These are actually the same ones that were in one of the slides prior, if you wanna go back and check the answers to those, but I also have them in the comments here. Okay, so let's write this function. So we have a function, product of all other numbers, right? And it takes an array, we know that. Okay, so what do we wanna do here? We want to loop over this array and create two different arrays, right? The first array being the products of all the numbers before whatever index we're on. And the second array will be the products of all the numbers after the index that we are on in the, uh, in the for loop, right? So let's get started here. Um, I think we can do, right, cons products before right, products of, these are the, what is a good variable name here? These are the products of all the numbers before a certain number, right? So this is the products of the before numbers. I don't know, if you have a better name, leave it in the comments below. But these are gonna be the products of all the numbers that come before an index in the array, right? So let's make our for loop here, for let i equal zero i is less than r dot lang i plus plus okay so we're looping over our um our array that we've been passed in right and remember this is a greedy algorithm so we are going to keep track of the product that we have so far and only continue to multiply by the next product right the next number in the iteration so what does that mean for our first index right so our first index, there is nothing before, nothing comes before it. So in this array, we can set that equal to one because anything multiplied by one is itself. So that is a safe thing to just insert when there is nothing, there is no product so far, right? So let's initialize that here. Let's say let product so far, and this is remember the numbers, the before product, right? So this is the before product so far. So let's set that equal to one. And so here, when we're at index zero, right? So R of zero, R of zero, there we go, right? We want to be, what do we want to add there if we're tracking all of the products so far before the array at zero? It's going to be one, right? That's, that's the products of all the numbers that came before it. So here, instead of, um, 
multiplying anything because we're at the beginning, we can actually just say products of before numbers, right? So that's that array that we're tracking all of the before numbers at i, which is the index of our iteration, right? We want to set that equal to the before product so far, right? So we don't just want to do that. We want to add an equal sign. And there we go, right? So that makes it have that that first iteration, there's something there, right? There is something that we can then multiply the rest of the numbers by, and it won't actually affect anything. That's why we're using one. So now what do we want to do with one? We want to kind of get it ready for the next iteration, right? So the next iteration is going to right? so instead of the zero with index, so let's take, for example, this this array right here. So the product of all the numbers before one are just going to be one, right? The products of all the numbers before two is going to be the products of all the numbers before one multiplied by one, right? That's that greedy solution. We're taking the next possible optimal solution and we're almost gobbling it up greedily. And we are going to continue to do that for the entire length of the array. We're going to keep getting the next one, adding the next one, adding the next one. So here we can do something like this, right? We can say that the before product so far is now going to be equal to times equal, right? So we're assigning and also multiplying by whatever is at that array of i, right? So what that does is that we are able to, as we move the i up, 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 we are ready for the next iteration with a multiplication already. We found the products of all of the ones before the next iteration, and we're ready for that. And we continue to do that until the very end. So let's walk through this example one more time, right? So we go through i is 0. We have um, array at i is 1, right? So the products, the products, the before product so far is going to be one in this case. So for our first iteration, I'm going to just write this up here. I hope this is, you know, you understand what I'm doing. So here we're going to have a one, right? So that's going to be the products, the before product so far, right? Then we're going to continue with our iteration, right? And we are going to multiply the before product so far with whatever was at this array of i, which in this case is 0. So in this case, this is 1 again. So this stays 1, right? And then in our next iteration of our loop, right, we now set at 1, we set it to whatever the before product so far is, right? So it's 1 again, right? So that's just because we have a one here and also we set that first iteration. The first loop is going to be a one, two. Okay, so now we are at the before product so far again, and now we're gonna multiply it by whatever is at the array of at index one, right, which is two. So we have one, right? So one times two is two. And we get two, which is now the, the new answer, right? This is going to be the answer for all of the product, the products of all the numbers before three, right? So here where i is three, but the before product so far is now going to be the greedy collection of the numbers that came before it. And then we come back here, right? We're at uh, three and we have, so far we have two, right? So now we're going to multiply two times three, right? Two times three is six. And that is going to be our next number here, right? And six is equal to the products of all of the numbers before four, right? So I hope you followed that. Um, it's actually, it's pretty simple, again, um, when you actually walk through it step by step. So this is not this, right? So that now is when we have to now walk through the array backwards and do the same thing for all the numbers after each index, right? Because the sub problems here are when you ask for the products of all of the other integers except for the one index in the array, what you're actually asking for is a, the product of all of the numbers before and the product of all the numbers after. So that's how we're breaking it up. I hope that makes some sense. Uh, let's get started with our next loop. And now you might be asking, if this has two loops, why is this better than the nested for loop? Well, when you have two loops that are at the same level, you, that actually just becomes uh, 2n, right? 
big O of N being it grows as the array grows. And because there are two loops that happen side by side, you add a two as a constant before the N, which drops as opposed to n squared, which is when for every iteration of one loop, you then set off another iteration of a second loop of the entire length of the array or input whatever again. So that's just for the record in case anyone was confused about why this is actually better for us. Okay, so let's make our second loop here, right? So let's say uh, let j equal to, and now we want to iterate backwards, right? So we actually want to start at the, the array dot length minus one, right? We want to start at the end of the array and now we're gonna um, iterate backwards by decrementing, de decrementing, decrementing uh, J backwards until we get to zero, right? So while J is greater than negative one, let's say J plus plus. Okay, oh, nope, always do that. Minus, minus, there we go. Okay, so now we're going, we're walking through that same array backwards, right? And we wanna do the same exact thing. So this is going to be, let's say, let after product so far, and we can also set that equal to one. Uh, and then we can do a const products of after numbers. And this is again, gonna be just a collection of all of the products of all of the numbers that come after one of the numbers in, a, in our array. Okay, so we're walking backwards, right? So what do we wanna do here? We wanna set the products of after numbers at J. We wanna similarly set it to the after product so far, right? And again, this is the same as before, except this is just in reverse. Okay, and then what do we want to happen to the after product so far? So we want the after product so far, we want it to be times equal r at j, right? So again, we are just going to greedily continue as we iterate with our loop, we are going to keep grabbing that next number and adding it, right? Keeping track, that's the sub problem. And each iteration, we eventually reach the end when we've gotten the product of all of the numbers that are after, right? This first index. So let's walk through that here. So here, so this is the before, right? I'm gonna label this. I wanna line it up nice for you guys. Okay, and here are our afters, right? Okay, so we start at the end of the array, right? And so far our uh, after product so far is just one. So we can set that here. So fun fact, this you can actually set indices in an array, even if the ones before it aren't filled. If you do this in your console or in you know Node or whatever, wherever you wanna see this, and you set, let's say an array that's equal to an empty array, and then you set the array at index 10 to be something, um, it will have uh, nine empty entries before it. So that's just something interesting, um, but you can actually do that. So let's, you know, we have a bunch of empties here, right? So at first we're at four or index three, excuse me. So we have four, right? And the first thing we do is we set at this second array, we set at index J the product so far. So at this point it's one, right? We have nothing so far. Okay, so bear with me while this, while I type backwards and all this uh, nice lining up I'm doing doesn't work. So, okay, so what do we do then? Okay, so we get our, we have our after product so far and we multiply it by whatever, wherever we are in the array, which is four, right? So that becomes four. And this becomes the next, the next product so far, right? Now what that, what four signifies is at the third, at the second index, the products of all the number after it, which is just four times one itself. So that's four. So that's how we get that. And then we go again, right? We do um, four times three, right? So that will be the next one. So that will be 12. And now we have 12, which again signifies it's all of, it's the multiplication of all of the numbers 
after the spot we are at in our iteration, right? So this is uh, the first index and 12 is three times four, right? And then we iterate again, right? And we greedily take this two and we multiply 12 times two, which is 24, right? And that becomes at our index zero here, which again signifies that all of the numbers after one, two times three times four, it becomes 24, right? Okay, so now we have these two arrays, right? We have all of the products before and all of the products after, right? So what do we do now? That still doesn't equal this array right here, right? When I highlight it, you can't see it. So that defeats the purpose. But this array right here. So how do we get to that? Well, of course, if you multiply all of the products before with all of the products after at any given index, you will get the answer to our problem, right? So let's see. So if we did six times one, we'd get six. Excellent. If we did two times four, we'd get eight. Awesome. If we had one times 12, we would get 12. Sweet. And if we had one times 24, we would get 24. So that's how we do it. So now we can just make a third for loop, right? So we can say let k equal r dot length, right? Or zero, I guess, because we can go forwards this time, although it doesn't matter. Um, and we do k is less than r dot length, k plus plus. And the reason I'm using R is because all of these arrays are gonna have the same length, right? Every array that we've made so far is all gonna be the same array as the original array that we were passed in. So what do we do here? Now we finally want to create our products, right? This is gonna be the thing we return. So there is our products array. And what do we do? We just want to write the products at K, we want to set equal to the products of before numbers at k, right, times the products of the after numbers at k, right? So basically here, all we're doing is we're taking, as we iterate through each array, multiply the thing that's at this index by the thing that's at that index, thing that's at this index, this index the thing that's at this index with this index, et cetera, right? And then we can just return products. All right, so let's make sure that we get what we expect. And we do, we get 24, 12, 8, 6, 560, 350, 400, 280. 8, 0, 0, 0. Excellent. Now, of course, this solution was, in fact, its uh, time complexity is a big O of n, right? It only grows as the array grows because despite the fact that we're doing three loops, we do them, it's just the same loop three times rather than each loop growing in any, uh, you know, exponential way like it would have if it were nested. But we are making a lot of arrays, right? We are creating an array uh, up here. We are creating an array here. And we are also creating this products array. So that's not great. Is there any way that we can make it better? I think yes, right? Because the only reason we're really tracking this and this, right, is to get to this products array, is to ultimately get to this, this um, equation right here this, uh, you know, figuring out, like, how do these two different um, arrays uh, interact with each other to form our answer. And instead of keeping the two arrays separate until we join them, we can actually right away when we're looping over the array backwards, we can right here in this for loop, instead of adding to a new array, we can just modify the original array and then return that, right? We can say we not only do we want to have the uh, you know the products of the the after product so far we don't want to only save that we want to multiply it by whatever is at that index in that products of before numbers we can do that all in the same go so let's see how we can do that so I'm going to get rid of all of this. So we still want to do this, right? We still want to set, us, set ourselves up with those before products. 
And then the difference is now when we figure out the after products, we're going to immediately multiply whatever is the before product, and that's going to be our answer. So we can actually rename this to the products, right? And this is now going to return the products, right? So that makes sense. And now what are we going to do here in this second loop? So here we still need to track the number after product so far, right? That's going to be that the thing that we're using in our greedy algorithm, the products of all of the after the numbers after that we've already seen. We still want to keep track of that and then, you know, multiply it by each iter with each iteration of the for loop in addition to then multiplying its corresponding number of the products of all of the numbers that came before it. So let's set that up right here. So that's going to be let um, numbers after product so far equal one, right? And then we can do our loop, right? So let k equal to the array length, right? Minus one. And then we can do uh, while k is greater than negative one, k minus minus. OK, so that's our loop going backwards. And here, what we want to do is we want to set that products array at k. We want to set it equal to not only the numbers after the product so far, but we want to set it to the numbers after the product so far times the products, whatever's already at that index in the array, right? Because we're reusing that same array. So that is going to be products at k right here. So in that way, right, so if you come down here, instead of having this afters away, we right away multiply 6 by 1, we get 6. We right away multiply uh, 2 by 4, right? And that's how we get the 8. We right away multiply the 1 by 12, and we get 12. So we can save ourselves a couple arrays here and already, uh, you know, be constructing the array that we're going to return. OK, so of course, this is going to be the same, that we still want to multiply this right by whatever is at the array at this at k, right? So this is how we continue to greedily uh, multiply the product by the next number, right? And uh, I think that's it. So let's see what we get when we run our function. Scroll down so we see our test cases. And yeah, it looks like we get them all the same. 24, 12, 8, 6, 560, 350, 400, 280, 8, 0, 0, 0. So I just want to reiterate here what's happening. So we are still doing all of the same logic, right? We are still maintaining this afters. But instead of storing it in a separate array and then multiplying in a third step, we just get whatever the value is here, right? And we already immediately multiply whatever is in the befores array and then we just return that array so that's a way to save some space and a way to impress your interviewer possibly but um yeah it's just a cool way of you know really keeping it a uh, big o of n in both time complexity and space complexity okay so let's talk about dynamic arrays what makes an array dynamic so a dynamic array is an array that automatically resizes for you, right? So when you add something to an array in JavaScript, you don't have to think about how big that array is going to get. Under the hood, all arrays are dynamic arrays in JavaScript. But in some other languages, you have to be explicit about how big an array is going to be so that it can allocate mem memory accordingly and you know, operate on it in specific ways. So let's think, let's talk about some stats. So retrieving an element at a given index from a dynamic array, it takes constant time. It's a big O of one, basically because it already has all of its memory defined. And when you ask for something from it, the computer knows exactly where to get it from. So what makes it possible to be dynamic, right? If you've already allocated memory, how can you allocate more memory? So the way a dynamic array works is that when you've reached all of the, you know, it's you've already reached the capacity of the array. Before you add to the array, 
it has to actually get some new memory, right? It's like, hey, we only had, they told us we needed to have, you know, room for four, but actually they need room for five. And we only have set aside room for four. And we can't have a fifth, we can't just get new memory because another application might have already taken that storage. And an array stores things all together, right? All of the memory is side by side, so it can't just get another one. So the computer has to find more memory, right? So usually what happens is it doubles, right? It finds memory where it can be double the size that it is already. And that is when the append actually goes through. After it has already found new memory, copied over all of the elements that were already in it to the new array, and then you can finally append to it. So this in the worst possible case, right? Because on average, when you ask, when you try and append to a dynamic array, more often than not, you're not going to be the last element, right? More often than not, there's going to be room in the array for you, and then it's just constant. But in the worst case, it's going to have to double for that append. And so in the worst case, it is a big O of n, where n is the length of the array, because it has to copy over all of the existing elements, which would be n, right? And it has to put them in the new array before you can add. So here is an example of this, right? We have an array, we have one, two, three, and four, and you can see right here that this is to signify memory, right? So this is the old array. Now, if you try and push five into this array, let's say there's some other app's memory that is, you know, taking up space next to that original, you know, the array that originally only had four elements. So the first thing that has to happen is that the array has to double, right? It has to find a new home. It has to be double the size. So here's the resized array. And only then can you add that five, right? Only then can you actually append to that array. So what's actually pretty cool is that despite the fact that appending the worst case for a dynamic array is gonna be a O of N, when you double the amount of appends that will be a big O of one constant also doubles, right? When this array became this array, now we can insert four more things at a constant, or I guess three more things, right? Because this one is the one that was a big O of N. Now you have three more things that you can insert, append in a constant time. So because of those two things, that every single doubling also results in more possibility for constant inserts, appends, right? We, we say that that's amortized, which is essentially that it is averaged, right? We, we call that the same. And we, so you were allowed to say that appends for dynamic arrays are always constant time because we kind of give and get, right? So that's something super cool. Um, Again, in JavaScript, all arrays are dynamic. You don't have to worry about that resizing, but these are just some you know, different uh, fun facts about dynamic arrays and uh, time complexity uh, that goes along with the methods that are common for arrays. I hope you all enjoyed this first video in our dynamic arrays series. Like I said in the intro, I do believe that most interviews that you get are going to involve arrays and some knowledge of manipulating them and how they affect time complexity and space complexity. This is going to be something that is very much a big bang for your buck, right? If you only have a certain number of weeks to practice, you want to know these kind of, you know, easier to middle difficulty questions, just super, super inside and out. The harder things are very impressive if you know, but often are asked at the bigger tech companies like Facebook or Google. And it's the smaller companies that often are asking things that are kind of ultimately really trying to test your fundamentals, the things you're really going to be using at the job, which are array, you know, simple kind of array logic like this. So I hope you'll join us for our future videos in this series. I'm really excited about them and stay tuned.